Okay, good morning everyone. I hope you're all comfortable and welcome to this, the third meeting of this committee for 2016. Um, if you wish to use any tablet devices or electronic devices, could you make sure they're switched on uh, silent so they don't interfere with um, our deliberations this morning. Um, I'm going to go straight into our agenda this morning. The first agenda item today is to consider taking agenda item four in private. Has committee agreed to do that? Thank you very much. Agenda item two is moving on to our proposed work programme for going forward with the committee. And we have, as you see, a big round table evidence session this morning. And welcome to, to you all. We really appreciate you c coming along. Um, so we're looking, uh, obviously, to, for areas that we can take up uh, as part of our work programme. Can I thank you all for taking part in our informal session this morning? We got some very, very good uh, and interesting in information and direction from that this morning. Um, so, uh, going forward, we're looking to, to obviously identify what our priorities are. Um, the first, obviously, the first goal of the Parliamentary Committee is to, to look at how, how we do things. We have a, an expanded remit that will be considered by our Standards Committee. So, it gives us a, a, a focus, which I don't think will be a different focus, because I think human rights and equalities sit together, you know, and if we can... Um, do, do, do that together, then I, I think we make a, a huge difference in, in taking some of the issues forward. So over the coming weeks, that's, that's the things that we'll be looking uh, forward to. What I'm going to do this morning is to go around the table and let you all introduce yourself and your organisation. We have a very limited uh, period of time this morning, so we're going to try and you know, make it as free-flowing free and as much information uh, um, sharing as possible. Um, there'll be an opening question and then you, you, you can all come in on that. If you just catch my eye and we channel through through me, it means we can organise it a bit better and we don't give our um, uh, uh, um, official report people a, a serious headache when they're trying to record everything because we do want everybody's um, thoughts and aspirations on, on the record this morning. So I'm Christina McKelvey, um, MSP for Hamilton, Lark, Hall and Stonehouse and I'm the convener of the committee. I'm Colin McFarlane, I'm the director of Stonewall Scotland. We're one of the five lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans and intersex uh, equality organisations and we campaign for equality for LGBTI people in education, across our workplaces, in our communities and in our public services. Um, I'm Juliet Harris, I'm director of Together, the Scottish Alliance for Children's Rights. Um, we're an alliance of over 320 members, um, including NGOs, um, academics, professionals interested in children's rights issues and we work to promote the implementation of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, most recently, we've been involved in influencing the concluding observations that have just been issued to the UK um, and Scotland, of course, um, in June of this year. Hi, I'm not Fias Khan. I'm actually Parveen Khan. Um, no relative either. Um, but, I, yeah, I'm here from the Council for Methodic Minority Voluntary Organisation, and... Um, we are a national intermediary organisation and a strategic partner of the Scottish Government and we have a network of over 600 ethnic minority voluntary sector organisations and community groups throughout the country. Um, so, yeah, I'm here on behalf of that organisation. Good morning, I'm, I'm David Duncan, um, clearly from Police Scotland. Um, my role within Police Scotland is superintendent within Safer Communities. Uh, part of my function involves the, the service delivery element of equality and diversity to our communities across Scotland. Good morning. I am, I'm Jeremy Balfa. I'm uh, an MSP for the Lovians. Hi there. I'm Morven Brooks, and I'm from Scottish Disability Equality Forum. Uh, we're a membership, uh, a member-led organisation, and we support 45 access panels across Scotland. And those access panels are groups of volunteer disabled people who primarily look at physical accessibility, but more, more importantly, now looking at the social accessibility for disabled people. Good morning. My name is Rania Kusasi. I'm a lead youth worker with Sahelia, uh, Sahelia Zen Mental Health and Wellbeing. A BME Women's Organisation. I'm Annie Wells and I'm the MSP for Glasgow Region. I'm Mary Alexander and I'm the Deputy Scottish Secretary for Unite. We represent 1.4 million members across the UK in all different sectors of the economy. Like um, yourself, I've been involved in uh, the United Nations um, ICESCAR process uh, at making representations on workers' rights. So. Hello, I'm Willie Coffey. I'm MSP for Kilmarnock and the Irvine Valley. Morning, I'm Jatin Harrier. I'm the director of the Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights. 
we undertake a range of Scotland-wide strategic anti-racist activity. Hello, my name is Gordon McRae. I'm the Chief Executive of Humanist Society Scotland. Uh, we're a membership organisation with a national charity for people in Scotland wishing to live an ethical, rational, secular life. We've got about 16,000 members across the, the whole of the country and we campaign for e equality, human rights and uh, a, a more even playing field for people of all faiths and none. Good morning, I'm Mary Fee, MSP for West Scotland. Um, morning, I'm Helen Martin and I'm an Assistant Secretary at the STUC. The STUC is Scotland's Trade Union Congress and we represent over 570,000 uh, workers in Scotland. Um, if we could just note that I'm representing the S all the equality committees of the STUC and not just Dormans Committee, as it says in the papers. Uh, Alistair Pringle, I'm the National Director of the Equality and Human Rights Commission. We're the national equality body for England, Scotland and Wales and we're one of uh, Scotland's two A-status national human rights institutions. Good morning, everybody. I'm David Torrance, MSP, Kirkcaldy Constituency. Uh, Bill Scott, Director of Policy for Inclusion Scotland. We're a national disabled people's organisation, uh, membership-based like um, the Scottish uh, Disability Equality Forum. Uh, we've got 70 member organisations throughout Scotland. Our largest member is Glasgow Disability Alliance, with about 3,000 disabled people as members. Um, and we do a lot of uh, human rights-based work, uh, including at the moment compiling uh, the shadow report um, on implementation of the UN Convention on the Rights of Disabled People. Thank you very much. And last but not least... Yes. Sin sincere apologies, convener. I'm Alex Cole Hamilton, and I'm vice convener of this committee. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much. You see, we've got a lot of interest around the table this morning. But interestingly, from all of our discussions with you this morning, one of the key elements that came through very, very strongly was the issue about discrimination and how we tackle discrimination across all different sectors. And each uh, sectorial group had their own issues, but they seemed to be the common thread was about discrimination and how we report that and how we challenge that. So my opening question, I think, is going to come to the police. Um, in order uh, for you to give us maybe some uh, understanding of how you're uh, tackling uh, some of those issues and then we can maybe go to some of the experiences of some of the groups when it comes to discrimination and the areas that they feel should be tackled. So, Superintendent. Thank you. Um, yeah, I suppose my, my opening observation would be the key to tackling discrimination from our perspective lies in the pre-crime space. So we deal with the kind of ramifications of it when it becomes criminal or when it's reported to us. And there's a there's an understanding that a lot of hate crime is woefully underreported due to a lot of factors which may vaunt themselves throughout the, the course of discussion today. However, I think a key element in my view for, for the committee and, and people around this table today, including myself and my colleagues, is the promotion of tolerance in terms of all of the communities across Scotland, I think we're in a good place to start off with in terms of having a very tolerant society when you compare it with um, other societies across the world, including Europe and closer neighbours. Um, but the key to tackling um, intolerance, I think, comes from demonstrative leadership. Uh, and I think part of that comes from you know, the government function, leaders across society. Um, if we can create and maintain and enhance community cohesion, I think that breaks down attitudes within society, which then um, leads to um, a whole range of positive benefits for society, not least a more stable and secure society. It has a tangible impact on the threat from terrorism, whereby you get more co community cohesion. The strengths within those communities engineer out elements of terrorism that otherwise would exist but also in terms of the, the range of, you know, under the Equalities Act, all the protected characteristics, that change in societal attitude towards people who may look or are perceived to be different and challenging those um, attitudes and behaviours then leads to um, the chance to then minimise the number of people who act in a discriminatory fashion and then marginalise them in terms of being able to uh, focus on... Um, the positive benefits, which I think that where this committee needs to probably strategically aim in terms of, of that. From a police perspective, um, we have a zero tolerance um, approach towards hate crime in all its forms. We record hate incidents, so we take incident reports from the public um, where there may not be criminal elements, and our focus is on 
um, supporting the victims of those incidents or crimes and very much uh, tackling the offender. And this is done in partnership with a whole host of agencies, voluntary, public sector, private sector, third sector, um, very much nowadays uh, right across those elements um, and wherever possible bringing those offenders to justice. And there's a whole host of uh, options which uh, I think are, are open in, as, as I described it, the pre-crime space whereby not everybody gets dropped into the criminal justice process and can be dealt with through other, other means. And I think when it eventually gets to the criminal justice um, space uh, and us becoming involved, there's often a, a lead-in period where there's been misery and frustration of individuals that have been subjected to discriminatory acts. So trying to kind of hive people out of that process before it gets to the, the crime aspect is probably a focus for us within our sort of preventative work within Police Scotland with partners. Um, but I suppose fundamentally in rounding that up, um, we need to demonstrate that uh, intolerance and discrimination won't be tolerated uh, in Scottish society and just use a collective understanding of the issues and the powers and policies that we can all bring together around the table to, to tackle that. Yeah. Th thank you very much. I think we all know that this, this is all a big about jigsaw and we have most of the pieces but we don't have them all in the right order so I mean, you have given us very clear indication of it, zero tolerance the pre-crime you know the, the the issues that we need to um in order to educate before it becomes you know something that comes into the criminal justice system but we've got some experiences around the table and, and rania i think I, I'm, I'm i'm going to pick on you and um, because you had gave some very very clear um direction this morning on um some of the experience that that, that, that people have uh, going to the criminal justice. I think, Juliet, you've got a, a particular interest in how young people report crime as well. So, R Rania, do you want to, to go first? Yeah, we were saying that, um, unfortunately, there is a language barrier that prevents people from um, actually going and reporting crimes, hate crimes, or there is a fear that there is no follow-up um, regarding uh, reporting hate crimes. So we would like to work clo more closely with police and being able to see how we can tackle that issue, with, both with young people and with adults that we work with. Yeah. We would welcome that, absolutely. Um, we're doing a lot of work to try and break down the barriers to the reporting of hate, crime and incidents. Uh, as I, I mentioned in the first response, we recognise it's underreported across a whole range of diversity, um, protected characteristics, uh, race, faith being, being two of those, disability being another. And we're doing a lot of work to refresh our uh, approach to third party reporting centres, our online uh, reporting mechanism and trying to, I suppose, find new ways to, to engage proactively with young people and minority communities so that we have an understanding of what those issues are. So yeah, I would I'd welcome the opportunity to, to work with you more closely. It's important to note that discrimination against children and young people kind of goes beyond just the work of um, Police Scotland and hate crime, and it's actually it's embedded within Scottish society. Um, even within the Equalities Act, which I know isn't within the remit of the Scottish Parliament, it actively discriminates against children, um, and that's within the Equalities Act. Um, there's a culture of discrimination against children and young people across Scotland. You see this in signs of only one child or two children allowed in a shop at one time. The fact that mosquito devices are still illegal, it's still possible to have a device outside a shop that makes a noise that adults can't hear to keep children away. And I think if we had such a device that discriminated against um, people with a disability, BME, um, communities, people would be outraged. But the fact it discriminates against children, people are like, OK, that's fine. Um, even um, when it comes down to voting, then I think the fact that children and young people's voices weren't heard in the run-up to the um, vote on the membership of the European Union was or can be considered as discrimination against children and young people. And so we actively need to look at a culture change where we listen to and really respect the views of children and young people in line with Article 12 of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. When it comes to hate crime, I think it's actually important to take a step back and look at bullying within schools, um, because this isn't reported as hate crime, and this doesn't make up the Police Scotland statistics. And we know from an anecdotal evidence from our members that post, Brexit, post the Brexit vote, there has been an increase of um, bullying within schools against children from ethnic minorities um, 
And this is something that just isn't recorded and isn't researched. Um, so when we're looking at discrimination, I think it's really important to see that it's actually a culture change and we need to look at children and young people across all the different equalities groups um, to tackle the discrimination against them. Okay, Colin. Hey, but just to pick up on the point uh, that Juliet made there about bullying uh, and going back to the element around the pre-element before we get to the stages of uh, reporting of hate crime, we know um, from our perspective, which is a lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans perspective, that... Um, bullying is almost rife, it's endemic in our schools. 99% uh, of young people hear some form of homophobic language every day in the classroom. But the big issue is the fact that our teachers feel uh, that they don't have the confidence to tackle this issue in the classroom. So only 16% of our teachers in Scotland have had any training whatsoever about tackling or talking about LGBTI issues in the classroom. If we're not fostering a sense of inclusion within our schools, that then leads on to uh, ramping up of issues which can then lead on to hate crime incidents because we know that a majority of the hate crime incidents that happened against LGBTI people happen between the age brackets of 16 and 25. So that the perpetrators are young that are taking part in that. So if we're not fostering a sense of inclusion within our schools, we're not going to be able to tackle hate crime. And at the moment, our teachers do not feel confident talking about these issues in the classroom, and we need to tackle that quickly. Yeah, well, we've, we've been doing a bit of... Some of our members of the committee have been doing a bit, with, a bit of work with the Thai campaign and yep. looking at some of that, and they've got some very good um, research evidence that they'll be publishing soon on some of that, and we can we can work from that. Jeremy, did, you wanted to come in at that point. Yeah, thank you, Camina. I, I mean, just wonder if I could... One question to Juliet and one question to the, the superintendent. Um, to Juliet, you, you talk about bullying in school and the non-reporting of that. Um, do you think that's across all the kind of equality categories? And if it is, why do you think that's happening? I, I mean, I hear the same that people say, a number of disabled people say, I, I, I was speaking to a number of um, children who have um, healing loss last night at a reception. And all eight of them said they'd been bullied at school at some point in their career, but the school hadn't reported it. Is that a fear from a head teacher? And my quick question to the superintendent is, which of the equality issues do you think um, were furthest behind in regard to reporting and just people don't come forward? And do you have any view why that is as well? Thank you. It's a direct question to you, superintendent. <laughs> Okay, I'll take the second piece then. Um, <clears throat> I think anecdotally what we, we understand is that there is some evidence to suggest that disability uh, hate crime is very much underreported. Um, and what people tell us is that's probably due to just endemic societal attitudes towards disability and, and the nature of it. Um, in terms of us dealing with that, we're doing a lot of work to, to try and understand and provide a better service towards uh, disabled people and, again, encourage reporting wherever there is um, a crime or incident that they want to discuss with us. And we do that, again, through enhancement of uh, third-party reporting, direct reporting to the police and use of the online facility, but also direct engagement with um, representative community organisations. Okay. Alistair, with an overview... Would, would you be able to answer Jeremy's other question? Um, well, because you've got a, a sort of overview in, in all of these areas. What was your other question, Jeremy? Sorry. Yeah. Go to the whole issue of bullying in schools. Yes. Um, for whatever reason. Yes. And, and, the, lack of, and the lack of reporting. Yeah. But people say they are bullied, but if you look at the statistics that's coming out of local authorities, there seems to be very little bullying in regard yes. to sexuality or in regard to disability or race or whatever. Yes, indeed. Um, if I can, can I capture that together with, with, with another point and, and, and actually a response to your first question, which is the fact that we did a, a sort of fairly large scale piece of work with LGBT Youth Scotland and others um, last year, a year and a half ago, on the extent of prejudice based bullying in schools. Um, one of my concerns is the extent of uh, and, and the normalisation of sexualised bullying, and I actually think that the lack of prevalence of data there is one of the most concerning of all. Um, so where we have data, we do very little with it, but where we don't have data, particularly in sexualised uh, bullying, is, is something that I think needs urgent attention. Um, we've also been calling on um, mandatory reporting of bullying in schools, particularly prejudice-based bullying in schools. We went off to the UN to do that recently around racial discrimination, but have been calling on 
um, reporting on all forms of, of um, reporting all forms of prejudice-based discrimination. The response to date has been um, in terms of non-mandatory guidelines, so a refreshment of the existing framework for schools. Again, we don't think that's acceptable because we know that the majority of hate crime that takes place is with young is perpetrated by younger people, and we know that that doesn't start outside the, the, the schoolyard. So um, we've been pushing hard for that, um, for that to be made um, mandatory. Um, I think that the Scottish Government's approach is, to make, is not to make um, various levels of reporting mandatory for various reasons, but we'll continue to push on that. Um, I wanted to sort of add to, to Juliet's point, though, which is that um, discrimination, uh, direct and non-direct discrimination, takes many forms, and it isn't just the role of Police Scotland, it's, it's the role of all our institutions to deal with. Um, the Equality and Human Rights Commission, as, as a, a regulatory body, um, has, has a few roles here, and I think it's worth putting them on the table because, in part, we, we have a part to play. Um, we have a, a range of legal powers at our disposal, which, given, given the, the, the sort of size and scale of our resources available, we're a small team in Scotland, 18 staff. Um, we have to use them, obviously, strategically, but we do undertake inquiries and investigations into issues like um, uh, cleaning... Uh, um, cleaning workers' um, practice and their treatment, so vulnerable workers or human trafficking and the likes. Um, so it's so a range of legal powers. We can undertake judicial review. We can support discrimination cases if they're strategic of nature, and we do that regularly. So please bear this in mind when you're, when you're thinking about tackling discrimination. Um, we also undertake large-scale programmes of research. So we recently um, published a, a wide-scale survey into the extent of pregnancy and maternity discrimination in the workplace. Um, ten years on from the Equal Opportunities Commission's own research, looking at 3,000 employers and 3,000 employees, um, and very concerning to note that there's been absolutely no progress in ten years. So we have that um, at our disposal, uh, our disposal as well. But we have the Equality Act, and I think most importantly for this committee, um, um, a duty on all listed public authorities is to assess the equality impact, and I would suggest also to be considering the human rights impact of legislation and policy. And what we see time and again, and I'll give modern apprenticeships as an example, is that um, unintended qu consequences of not thinking through equality and human rights systematically, time and again in legislation and in policy, leads to direct and indirect discrimination in outcomes. Um, we have concerns about a range of current um, government um, uh, uh, programmes of work, including educational attainment, which is only fo focusing on postcode, which won't benefit young disabled people, uh, young gypsy travellers, and others who face unequal educational outcomes. There are, there are, there are a host of other um, issues that we, we could raise, but I'll stop there without hogging the microphone. <laughs> We're still interested to hear them, but so <coughs> let, let, let us know. Mary, you wanted to come in at that point. To, to come back um, on something that, that, that Colin had said in relation to LGBTI um, bullying in schools, and Alistair, you kind of touched on it in relation to, to data collection. But Colin, when you said that teachers aren't confident in dealing with it, are they not confident in dealing with it because they don't have the right kind of training? They can tackle bullying as a kind of bullying umbrella, but not s specifically in relation to LGBTI. And, and is that the same across all schools? Um, where, where do faith schools sit in this? Okay, so um, we're very careful about not differentiating between faith schools mm. and non-denominational schools because actually the situation is it's across the board mm. in all schools. And actually, in terms of the confidence levels, in terms of those schools who are doing really good work, it is teeny. It, it's really, really small and really, really patchy. Um, and in terms of the confidence levels, a lot of it is a hangover of Section 28. 75% um, of uh, sec primary school teachers and 44% of secondary school teachers in, uh, from our research have quite clearly stated that they are told by their management that they can't talk about these issues or they can't think they can talk about LGBTI issues in the classroom. Now, it's not because all these teachers are homophobic and they don't want to talk about it, but they still believe that, um, that Section 28 exists. 
a lot of it's around leadership, and it's a leadership within the school. So it's from the heads, and it's from the management teams who are setting out an ethos within the school. So where the schools are doing really, really well, it's part of the individual ethos of the school, where every child is safe, treated with um, dignity and respect. But in too many schools, that's not happening. Now, schools will have individual bullying plans, and what we have found is that within most of those plans, Gender is in there, race, disability, but there's no mention of LGBTI at all. So there is a, a, a blocker, if you like, this kind of wall that teachers can't seem to get their head round or get over in terms of the fact that they just do not feel confident talking about it. They're worried about losing their jobs. They're worried about the reaction from parents. And what we have found from our discussions with those schools that do it and do it well, the parents are joyful that these conversations are happening in the school because not only does it mean that they maybe don't have to have those conversations with their kids themselves, but actually it's leading them into a way that they can have those discussions with, those, with their children. So the myth that parents are going to react badly is a myth in itself, I think. Thank you. Hiri. Um, well, I, as you can imagine, as a union, we come across all uh, sorts of all forms of discrimination um, day in, day out. And, um, you know, I won't go into any great detail um, about that, there has been contributions about um, what's required to tackle disc discrimination, um, and we've heard culture change, fostering a sense of in inclusion, um, leadership, demonstrative leadership. Um, I recently went to the UN and made representations on a number of breaches of uh, the UN Convention on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Um, in terms of the Trade Union Bill and, and what became the Trade Union Act. We talked about zero-hour contracts, um, blacklisting, employment tribunal fees, and a whole host of other um, work-related practices um, where we felt um, that there, there had been breaches by the UK government and Scottish governments. And I think when we're talking about remedies or, or what we can do, I would hope that the Equal Opportunities Committee, with its human rights um, aspect to it now, would introduce a review process so that the concluding observations that we brought back from the UN, um, and we went there twice to give evidence, and there's a very robust process in place there, so that when, we, when those concluding observations um, are released, they actually come back here and they are acted upon. And uh, for me, that's what I find um, a, a bit disappointing. I know the Scottish Government is very committed to human rights, but, um, you know, I was probably a bit silly and excited when I came back thinking, look, you know, there's a number of recommendations here that are actually really important. We're signed up to, to the Convention. What is the Scottish Government going to do now? And really... I, I hope that the committee will look at introducing a robust review process and um, ensuring that they are compliant with what they're um, signed up to and what it says on, on, on the, the can. And that would, that's the same for the universal periodic review. We recently went to um, a meeting where we were encouraged to make representations. Um, and I think the last one was 2012, and there was something like 122 recommendations that came out of that. Um, I, I don't think there's, there's many of those being followed through. So um, that's what I, I would like to see, and I think that's alongside all these other um, useful points that colleagues have made. We hear you on the concluding <laughs> observations. We hear you. Um, Bill, and then I've got Alex. Yeah, um, just... Very briefly on the, the bullying topic, um, you know, we think there is massive underreporting of um, bullying of disabled children in schools. Um, and I think one of the reasons is that schools would prefer it to be dressed up as something else other than homophobic bullying, racist bullying, disabled bullying, etc., because they think it reflects badly on the school if that sort of bullying is taking place. And, and in actual fact, that hides the problem rather than recognising it, and it leads to the problem not being addressed. And it, you know, going right back to the original question about discrimination, we believe that discrimination is based largely on prejudice and ignorance. It's about fear of the other. And, and that disabled people, as one of the most excluded groups in, in our society, excluded from the workplace, 
you know, less than half of disabled people who work in age and work. Excluded from public life, you know, very few disabled politicians, etc. Um, and to some extent, still excluded from our schools. One third of children with additional support needs are not um, taught in mainstream schools, even though that's supposedly the default position for disabled children to be in mainstream schools. So, you know, the fact of the, uh, you know, disabled people's exclusion leads to an increase in discrimination because disabled people become other. They can't be known. We don't come across them in everyday life, etc. And if, if you do want to begin to shift that discrimination, you have to begin to include disabled people in schools, in the workplace, in public life. And it's only by addressing it in that way that people, the, the, the barriers of prejudice and ignorance begin to be broken down and you begin to see disabled people as just people rather than um, other and, and, and somebody to be pitied or feared or, in some cases, unfortunately hated. Um, uh, because, going back to superintendent again, we do believe there's massive, both under-reporting and under-recording um, a disability hate crime because it's not often recognised for what it is. Alex. Thank you, um, I think Mary Alexander's points about the concluding observations are very well made, and it's a discussion that we, as a committee, had at our away day that actually the concluding observations could present a roadmap both for this committee and the wider parliament in terms of addressing those areas of inequalities that still exist in Scottish society. Um, one particular concluding observation which keeps coming back um, to Scotland is the uh, issue of equal protection for children from assault. Um, and I'd invite Juliet to give us her reflections on um, that frontier of equalities that we still keep getting wrong. We are one of only something like four countries left in the Council of Europe that still allows children to be physically hit um, in their homes, whereas all adults are protected from this. And then secondly, on a separate point, I'd like Colin to bottom out um, and explore further that cultural uh, situation that he described, the hangover from Section 28, as it were, in our teaching community, and whether this is actually something we need to boil right down to um, modules within PGCE and uh, diplomas in education so that teachers are equipped with the toolkit necessary to address homophobic bullying in our schools. I'd like to come in first, then Colin, and then we'll come to more, more from you. Yeah, so quickly on eco protection, then this really highlights the importance of using the concluding observations as a roadmap for the um, Equalities and Human Rights Committee. Um, equal protection has come up in the Universal Periodic Review, it's come up in the Committee Against Torture, it's come up in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, it's come up in the Convention of Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. Um, it is a repeated recommendation and it is Scotland's shame that children still do not have the same protection as adults from assault. And I think that reinforces the point that I made earlier um, about the fact that discrimination against children is seen as acceptable. Um, I would really urge the Human Rights Committee to push for action on this because it's an absolute travesty that it hasn't been addressed. Um, it is one of a number of concluding observations that have made, been made repeatedly by, um, by international treaty bodies. And I think Mary's point was made really well about the concluding observations. I endorse that. And I know she talked about the number of recommendations that we had from the Universal Periodic Review. But I would urge the committee not to be overwhelmed by the number of concluding observations, because actually you're doing a lot of this work anyway. Um, in the letter that was tabled um, in the papers by Angela Constance, the work that you're doing on LGBT and bullying has been raised through three different international treaty bodies. Um, sexual health education, that's been raised by treaty bodies. And so by focusing in on the concluding observations, it will just add weight to the work that you want to do anyway. And it will make sure that any gaps that aren't being picked up, like equal protection from violence, are uh, taken forward within the Scottish Parliament. Yeah, thank you. Go on. Um, are, you, are, you, are you talking about... It? Directly working within teacher training colleges? Yeah, so um, you're absolutely right. This isn't endemic to older teachers. Um, what we're finding is that uh, teachers who are going into the teaching profession are also being told that Section 28 still exists and so therefore they shouldn't be talking about it. Um, and we do think that there needs to be uh, more of a focus on ensuring that within the 
the modules and the training modules, that LGBTI inclusion and inclusive education is part of that. We know our colleagues at LGBTU Scotland are doing some work on that, and that's very welcome. Um, we ourselves offer a, a, a train-the-trainer programme for teachers already in schools, which is a one-day training session which basically gives them a roadmap, um, the tools of which they can then go back into the school themselves and uh, train their peers. And from independent evaluation of that, uh, we have found that that has been extremely successful. We can't keep up with the demand at the moment because so many teachers want to come onto that training, which is great. We've been having conversations with the Deputy First Minister um, in his uh, portfolio as Education Secretary with our colleagues at LGBT Youth about how we can work with Scottish Government to ensure that we might be able to accelerate that programme and, and we're hopeful from those conversations. But it is about absolutely tackling it within teacher training colleges themselves, but it's making sure the continued professional development when teachers are in schools is also part of that and our teacher training programme should be absolutely central to that. Thank you very much. Colin Morvan. Um, it was just to follow on, I'm just really echoing what Bill Scott said earlier around the fact that disabled people shouldn't be seen any more differently than any, anybody else. There's a number of issues that have obviously come up around the discussion on, on discrimination, um, and I just wanted to touch on a couple of those points. Um, inclusive communication being one of them. Um, you talk about hate crime. I mentioned this earlier in our discussion I had. Terminology and the language we use every day we should, we should go back to plain English for everybody, not just for disabled people, but for everybody's sake as well, just so we understand what we're all talking about, what we mean, what we want to do. Um, more importantly, obviously, for our stakeholders are obviously disabled people, so it's important that we, we obviously take forward that inclusive communication element. Um, you've got accessibility. Accessibility is still a huge issue around... You've got transport, you've got employability, you've got education. Accessibility is just the, the ground of everything, especially for if you have a wheelchair user, you can't, a wheelchair user student who can't access the school, for instance, to get to their education. Uh, employability, a lot of employers are not recognising that they need to invest in reasonable adjustments, um, obviously to increase their uptake on disabled um, employees. Um, and, yeah, so basically, the, the whole issue around discrimination, the, the, I, would, I would point out these issues, inclusive communication, employability, and accessibility is most important. You've got housing is also a big issue still as well uh, for a lot of disabled people. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. Thank, thanks very much. Um, we've, I, I, I'm conscious there's a couple of voices we've not heard around the, the, the table this morning. I don't know if, there's, if, if, if you want to come in on um, and your thoughts as well, and we'll make sure everybody gets something on the record this morning that will help us going forward. Parveen, do you want to come in first? Yes. And we're, uh, we're sorry about your, your name No, no, th no worries at all. I just didn't want people to think that I just snuck in uh, <laughs> ahead of Fias. Um, but no, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, and it has been interesting to hear people's contributions. But within Seven of Scotland, we've, um, in the past three years, been delivering a race and equality mainstreaming support programme and it focuses on supporting public uh, statutory and third sector agencies to progress race equality. And from what we've learned is that, you know, often within the Equality Act, we've, we look at, obviously, there's protected characteristics and there's nine of them. But any policies that are being developed or anything that's been put into place is often, you know, missing out, not looking at strand specific often looking at this kind of, we know that it's not a one size fits all. Alistair and I will share that from an NHS background. We've, we've kind of exhausted that. But there is often the attempt there to try and make the policies um, compliant and meet the needs of all protected characteristics. And what you find is within that you will miss out huge chunks of the population. And hearing about the anti-bullying policies, that's been my experience. Anti-bullying can't possibly address all the different strands in terms of hate and prejudice against various groups. It can't possibly pick up on disability. It can't possibly do that because it is more often than not a blanket policy. And you know that's something that we need to get better at um, and not just look at the business of the organisation and what we are promoting um, to have the policy fit that, but really take into account that we need to quality impact assess um, everything um, from the word go, from the inception of a policy to actually making it happen. So that's something that we're working with, um, with the organisations on. 
You, you mentioned a, a, a wee hobby horse of mine, quality impact assessments. How well do you think these are done? Well, the, <laughs> I think there is a real commitment. I think there is a commitment, I would say that. <coughs> um, how well depends, again, on what your business is. What is your core business? That's where the focus will be. And I think that's where um, you know, the resources are targeted, that's where the incentive will be, and that's where the, the, you know, your, your actual work will be. So at the end of the day, we need to think beyond that and actually look at quality impact assessing and all the protected characteristics and looking at some of the intelligence gather, gathering, the data gathering, and apply that when you're actually looking at a quality impact assessment. So it shouldn't be a, a quick and dirty exercise. It should be something that should be full on um, so, so, yeah, that's what we're actually working with um, the public sector, private, uh, uh, statutory bodies and third sector agencies to actually say it should be a process from start to end. Yeah. Jasmine. Thanks. Uh, just on that last one. Uh, I think we'd go a bit further and say there really isn't a proper commitment to equality impact assessment. I don't think people even understand uh, what is required so they're ticking boxes without knowing what they're doing. If we had proper equality impact assessments, we wouldn't be where we are now, four or five years on. And it's not really four or five years on, because this has been a longer process than since the Equality Act. Um, so there's a, certainly one of the things we, we are calling the Equal Ops Committee to do is, after the next round of public sector equality duty reporting in April, to do a full-scale inquiry on what has worked, what hasn't worked, what, what needs further uh, input. Um, just to, to take the other discussion wider, I, I don't think we should give up on mandatory reporting of bullying. I think the government might not want it, but it's up to Parliament to make the decision at the end of the day. And I don't think we should give up on that. That might be a step to achieving some of what people have been asking for around this table today. Um, on, on a much wider scale, and, and Superintendent Duncan mentioned this uh, very briefly, it's about community cohesion and promoting good relations. And again, that's part of the public sector equality duty, but probably the least understood, the least implemented part of the uh, public sector equality duty. Um, not quite sure, well, it is probably the more difficult aspect of delivering on, on PSED, but if we don't get that right, we'll, we'll be having these conversations about um, these things for, forever and ever. And finally, for now, and I don't know if this is the right place to say it, but for the record, CRER and others are still not convinced that expanding the remit of this committee is the right thing to do. There is so many actual equality issues to be discussed and examined, rather than widening the remit into human rights as well. Uh, so we've written to, to you and, and to the Standards Committee about that. Um, we think there's still a discussion to be held before that's agreed. Well, hopefully we can reassure you that it's not, we won't, we won't be sitting in two separate silos that equalities will be pushed aside to deal with, with, with human rights because I think the view, the view of the committee, and, and I don't want to preempt any of this, is, is that it, it just makes sense for the two things to, to, to fit together. And we're hoping that that will work. No, we are endeavouring. I'm not going to say hope because that means that there's some doubt in that. There, there's, there's not any doubt in it. I think we, we are absolutely committed to ensuring that sectoral, issues are not pushed aside in, in, in advantage of, of human rights because we don't see the two things as separate. So, you know, if it's a sectoral issue, it will fall within a human rights uh, format anyway. So, so please, please be reassured on that, that um, we, we, we won't be pushing some things aside in order to, to do that. Okay, if I can come back, um, yeah. that, that, that is reassuring. Uh, so you will agree to having a review of this in a year or two years' time to make sure what you've just said does happen? But that we have some ongoing discussions about the format and the process that we'll go through to ensure that this committee does what it says in the tin. Okay. <laughs> um, it, some of that is sort of a, obviously in, in the process right now. So we can, hopefully we can reassure you and continue to, to, to do that. Um, Helen, you wanted to come in at this point, yeah? Yeah, I think, um, I think from the STUC, we, we, we would welcome actually the inclusion of human rights into, into the remit of the committee. And um, perhaps what I'm going to say shows exactly how human rights and equalities actually fits together really well, because one of the issues that we've been picking up on it it fits well with what Mary's, Mary was talking about around Icheska and the economic and social and cultural rights, um, is the interlink between precarious work and um, discrimination. And uh, we at the STC have been running now a campaign called Better Than Zero that looks 
specifically at supporting young workers on precarious contracts. And through that campaign, but also through the work that unions do more widely and through um, the work that the EHRC did on pregnancy and maternity and, and lots of other pieces of evidence, we're starting to see a really worrying picture developing in Scotland where we are seeing workers who are on precarious contracts, zero hours contracts, agency work umbrella contracts, are much more likely to be facing discrimination than um, other workers within the labour market. And that discrimination is of a style that we perhaps haven't seen in the labour market in quite some time. So we are much more likely to see straight up sex discrimination cases where people are being asked to wear short skirts, they're being asked to um, behave in a, in a certain way, they're being asked to hide their sexuality, they're being asked to do different things to um, present an image to the customer. And if they refuse to do those things, they are dismissed effectively because they are not given any more shifts. And the workers are feeling very, very vulnerable because they are on such precarious contracts. They feel that they are unable to challenge. They sometimes don't even realise that they can challenge because there is a lack of understanding that equality of law applies even if you're in precarious work. Um, we feel that employers are becoming more likely to use old practices where they uh, ask for pictures and they make sure that you know people at front of house are very beautiful and ethnic minority people are put at back of house and you know things that we wouldn't have seen in the labour market for quite some time are now routine practices again. And um, we think that it would be very, very useful for this committee to have some consideration of um, the interlink between discrimination and precarious work. And I think that fits well with the government, it fits well with human rights issues, it fits well with the Fair Work Agenda. And I think it would really be something quite useful that could shine a light on a practice that's extremely worrying and is, frankly, I think, growing and that we don't have a very good understanding of at the minute. Yeah, th th thanks very much. Gordon. Um, I think I would share you know, with, the, with the assurances you mentioned, um, we would certainly welcome the expansion of the remit. We have had some concern for some time that a lot of the human rights orientated commitments the Scottish ministers have made in recent years haven't always had the scrutiny uh, on, on the back of it that, um, that would ensure that the, the, the aspirations are always delivered on. I mean, one example for us right now is the very recent Young Children and Young People's Act. Um, makes a very clear commitment to, you know, for Scottish ministers to, to consider what further steps they can take to, to secure uh, rights. And we had the UN uh, Rights of the Child review make a number of recommendations, and in, from our own sectoral interest, a uh, very clear um, recommendation that it was time to ex expand the right of young people, uh, the, the currently just a parental right to opt out of religious observance in schools um, to young people, a right that young people in England and Wales have, but is denied young people in Scotland. Uh, and the Scottish Government have, decided, have, have informed us they, they have no intentions to do so. Um, and we think there's those types of, you know, when, you make, when you make a commitment in, in one piece of legislation, we have a, a responsibility and needs to be scrutiny about how we, we take things forward. Um, for us as humans, the last year has been something of a, a tipping point, we're now, Scotland is now a country where a majority of people say they have no religious affiliation and humanist weddings now outstrip demand for denominational weddings. And I think it does, from our perspective, demand a bit of a new thinking around, well, how do we approach a, a, a secular society that protects every faith and people of none? And in particular, we, we, you know, I see in the papers from ministers you talk about faith schools and, and, and non-denominational. Every school in Scotland, every state school is a faith school. There are no non-faith schools. We have denominational and non-denominational schools, but they're all, they are all faith schools. Um, and we do think there is still systemic discrimination against non-religious, humanist, atheist, uh, young people who are denied equal, the same rights as, as other people. In particular, um, I, mean, I mentioned the, the the right that young people elsewhere in the UK have to opt out of religious observance. But there is a specific issue in some, some not all, some denominational schools around access to, to uh, sex and relationship education. And I know that you know, Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board have expressed real concerns about the access that their workers have to, to go into schools. So I think there is scope for this committee to, to be looking at you know, what are the consequences of some of the commitments that ministers make? What does that require future, future steps? Um, and potentially also to, to start thinking about well, what does Scotland in 2016 onwards look like 
when we are a, a farm, you know, there is no single world view that, that, that longer dominates. We are a, a nation of, of many beliefs rather than one. Thank you. Alistair. A wee bit um, to, to um, my, old, my shared hobby horse with you, which is around the quality impact assessment, um, and, and just say that we've been monitoring um, the, um, the publication of public bodies' reports around their specific duties um, since they were introduced in May 2012, and we will be doing a piece of work to look at the effectiveness of the specific duties um, after the four-year cycle um, next year, April 2017. Um, our role is to monitor um, the effect and impact of those duties, and I do have concerns. I've had concerns since I worked in the NHS 15 years ago, uh, since I worked in central government 10 years ago, and now as a regulator, um, that parts of these duties just aren't working. And I think the sooner that we put that on the table and acknowledge it, we can start thinking about what is the outcome we want to achieve and how might we achieve that, because the amount of meetings I turn up at as the regulator and this great big files pushed over and, and I see some poor soul in the corner sweating buckets is that that's the year's work, 100 equal impact assessments. And I push it aside to tell me one thing that's changed as a result of doing that work. So there is, there is something about thinking about equality impact assessment differently. And I think part of that's about the language. I think as you move to a, an integrated equality and human rights mandate, um, there's a real potential opportunity for us to think about how we do some of this differently. Because for me, Equality impact assessment and human rights analysis is about going out and speaking to people to say, what's your experience of the NHS? What's your experience of the education system? What, do the, what does the equality and human right, you know, what does the equality law say about what you can expect? And what does the human rights framework say about what you can expect? And how are we going to deliver that? What are the solutions here? Um, too often it is junior officials or, or people in, white tower, in ivory towers sitting without a world view, um, and, and I very much welcome the approach that you're taking as a committee this morning, being a great example to say, what is the lived experience of people using our education systems? And I wouldn't just be thinking about bullying in schools, I would be thinking about attainment and the gendered norms that go on, and, and which lead to the fact that we have to set targets for 50-50 by 2020 because nothing else in the system is working. So yes, let's focus on, equality, focus on equality impact assessment, but not the form. Um, let's think about how we, do, how we do this in a more creative way with, with a clear eye on what is the outcome that that's meant to achieve and is it achieving it? Bill. Yeah. Our experience is, unfortunately, that equality impact assessments are an afterthought rather than a forethought. And then rather than building equalities into the planning of service delivery, they, they're done as an afterthought. How, you know, how, how is this complied with the law? Uh, to give you a co very, very concrete example that EHRC know very well, the Modern Apprenticeship Programme. It was a brilliant thing that the government decided to invest in young people in 26, 27,000 modern apprenticeships a year. It was a total disaster that actually intensified existing inequalities. In, in its achievements because occupational segregation occurred between young men and young women. Uh, race, uh, BME were underrepresented in, and in terms of disabled people, there should have been around three, three and a half thousand, four thousand disabled, young disabled people taking part in, in the modern apprenticeship scheme each year, instead of which we had 70 or thereabouts. Now, that was a failure to build in from the outset what the objectives should have been and what the outcomes should have been for the modern apprenticeship scheme. And that's where equality planning can come in. And, and we are very pleased that the committee are going to take on uh, human rights as well as equalities because what human rights should be about and what equality should be about is the elimination of existing inequalities uh, over time and the realisation of human rights through the elimination of those inequalities. So we're very pleased. And the economic, social and cultural rights, we think, are fundamental. Um, the recent uh, JRF report, uh, Joseph Rowntree Foundation report, just released in the last month, shows that half of all the people living in poverty in our society are either disabled people or people who live with disabled people. E taking care of disabled children or have a disabled partner. Now, that, that is you know, a tragedy, 
and, and an enormous waste in our society, human resources, which we should begin to address. And you know, the independent advisor on poverty and equality has said what we should be thinking about, and I think this is where maybe where the committee should direct its attention, where can you make the most difference? And I think you can make it in young people. And, and a crucial stage is that transition from school to work. And, and, and if you could look at that and begin as a, to make a difference to young people's life chances to break that cycle of inequality and break that cycle of poverty by strategically intervening or making recommendations for strategic intervention at that key stage in the developing young people's lives. I think for young people leaving care, for black minority ethnic people, for young women, for young disabled people, that's where you can make the most crucial difference to their lives. I really do, you know, I think it's, it's a terrible thing. I, in no way do I want you to write off, you know, working age disabled people or, or older disabled people, but I think you could make the biggest difference if you began to look there. And one of um, the independent advisor's recommendations was to carry out a comprehensive re review of how policies were impacting at that. And if, if you could do that within this committee, I think you could make a, a huge difference to how policy is viewed and begin to get equalities addressed in some of the key policy areas that could make a difference. Thanks, Bill. Willie Coffey. Thanks very much, Convener. I, I was actually going to, to try to tease some of that information out of Bill that he's just actually shared with the committee there, because it was a very interesting conversation I had with him this morning, and it was, it was quite an eye-opener, actually, to hear that. So I'm glad that you've done that, Bill. But one of the other issues that you, you did raise was just what you touched on at the end here. It was about how young people, particularly with disabilities, make transitions from where they are to where they would like to be, whether that's into the modern apprenticeship programme or to college or wherever the world of work and how difficult they find that. And I think you said to me this morning that the statistics actually get worse as the years roll by. And that, that has to be a, a worry, I think, convener for us in the committee. So it's to explore with you, and I think Morvan as well, how what, what we could do better to assist young people, particularly with disabilities, to, to make sure that they get access to help, advice, support to feel as though they're part of the system. And, and I think I'd like to also say, convener, that I think it was Ryan there that, that mentioned to us this morning that making things fair doesn't necessarily make them equal. And that's some things that we might overlook that. So I think there's a lesson there. You have to make, you have to feel as though you're part of the system as well. And particularly young folk don't feel as though they're welcome as part of the system to, to, to help them through and make transitions. So I'd be very much obliged to Bill and Morvan, if they could flesh out a wee bit more of that for us and give us some examples. Yeah. Morvan, do you want to come in first then and we can come back to Bill? Yeah, the biggest thing I think is attitudes and awareness, obviously, of disability, especially when it comes to employability. Um, the equality internship that was last year, wasn't it? Um, I think there was 40 applications that went through. Um, I'm not quite sure what the final figure was. I'll find out of what the figure was of how many actually succeeded in full-time employment from those internships. But the biggest barrier there was around accessibility, around, and it's not just physical accessibility, it's actually access to the, the, the equipment or what they need to, to do the job. Now, you've obviously got access to work, but the, the time that it takes, especially if you're on an internship programme, the time that it took to actually get the appliances needed, the internship was nearly up. So it was a bit pointless. Um, also, the fact that DWP people's benefits were affected. But again, this was just an example through the internship programme itself. But in real life, if somebody was going for a, a full-time employment job, um, a disabled person needing requirements, their benefits will stop at a certain point if they're going into full-time employment. But there a, there's a gap there for them, and that's no good. If you've, if you've got needs as a disabled person, you, you've obviously got rent, um, and it's a worry for them as well, and it's added stress. So there's a lot of there's a lot of impact there, especially um, around disability, um, and obviously the accessibility side. I've talked about obviously the, the needs to actually do the job, but also the physical accessibility as well. What's, what we're hearing is that a lot of employers, um, they, they do need, there's a lot of training and awareness required around the attitude, what's required, reasonable adjustments. It, is, it can be costly for an employer, but they also have to take into account longer term how many uh, disabled people they're looking to employ. Uh, and again, a lot of people, are, a lot of employers class disabled people as high risk 
Um, and that's just from our sort of research. It is classes, they are classes high risk because it's uh, obviously you've got the, the impact assessment that they'll have to do themselves. Um, and obviously the cost associated with implementing those reasonable adjustments as well. Um, but we, we are doing, as an organisation, we are working with the access panels they get the message across to their local employers around access, the physical accessibility um, that they need to take into account to help disabled people get into employment in their areas. Um, we are also working on a, a, an employability hub to collect resources for employers to help them employ disabled people. Um, there's also uh, an inclusive communication hub, because again, communication as well is also an element, inclusive communication, how that's delivered. Um, you, you've also got requirements if, uh, the, if you've got a BSL user looking to be employed. Again, there's a cost implication there. How, how, how does that employer work with the employee if that needs required? So th there's a lot of things there to take into account. There's a lot of training for an employer to take into account. Um, but this inclusive communication hub as well that we're working on, again, it's a resource bank for the purpose of employers to go to to get that information. So we, we, we are tr trying to make steps to obviously make that improvement, but we would encourage, obviously, support in getting that message across. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, to just give you the figures, um, a young disabled person at age 16 as a school leaver, is twice as likely to be not in education, training or employment as a non-disabled peer. But by age 19, they're three times as likely to be in that position. So things don't improve after leaving school. They actually get worse. And part of that is because a lot of the support that is provided to disabled children at school just simply stops the moment they leave school. Um, and, and that has very, very practical consequences. For example, we were up in Inverness earlier this year speaking to uh, groups that work with young disabled people, and they were pointing out that the ludicrous situation exists where school children, young uh, disabled school children with additional support needs who wanted to go to Inverness College got taxis there and back because they were still at school. So they because the college offered those courses, they could get taxis there and back. But children, young people of the same age who had left school had to get there by bus, and the bus service wasn't accessible. <laughs> so they couldn't get to the college <laughs> because social work no longer supplied them with taxis to do so because they'd left school. And that's what I'm saying about thinking about this strategically how an investment at that age for that particular group of young people could make an enormous difference to the rest of their life. Because if they can acquire skills, acquire work experience, etc., and, and begin to get on the employment ladder, then that, that could be for the next 40 years, 50 years. If they don't, it could be the opposite for the next 40 or 50 years. They remain unemployed, which is what half of um, over half of all uh, disabled people are, is, is workless. So you know, if, if we can begin to think of the policies that we, we implement at that key stage in the development of young people, and that's all young people, but taking into account the particular needs of the most excluded groups and invest in that and invest in employability schemes, work experience schemes, uh, set training schemes, et cetera, at that age to equip young people with the skills of the modern labour market, then we could begin to make a real difference. And I, you know, I'll keep on coming back to that. I think also one of the best kept secrets in the, in the world, uh, uh, certainly in the UK, is the Access to Work Scheme, which actually does fund adaptations to employers' premises and provides software if you've got communication impairments. Et cetera. And for small employers, that's a 100% government grant to, towards those costs. And it simply isn't well known enough and again, I think Scottish Government and you, you yourselves could look at that and, and begin to promote that to uh, small businesses because um, if uh, small businesses knew about this, some of the barriers which are in their heads, which are again based on prejudice and ignorance about the costs of employing a disabled person, could be overcome and we might see more welcoming uh, into the workplace. And then once you've, you've established that a disabled person can work in you, in there. Uh, and once an adaptation is made to a workplace, it's there forever. You know, 
it, it, it means not only is it accessible to that worker, but to workers that follow them, and possibly to new customers who weren't able to access those premises before. So there's all sorts of things that we, we should be thinking about um, in, ter in terms of opening up access to, to those most excluded groups. We're coming up against the time barrier, and I've got Juliet wants to come in on this point, and Helen it wants to come in, and then I've got a couple of members who want to come in as well. So if Juliet, if, if you can make your remarks quite succinct, and Helen, and, and we'll move on to the other members that want to come in. I just wanted to reinforce what Bill said around the importance of children and young people in considering their human rights, and um, just mention to the committee for the record around the Children and Young People Act that there is now a duty on um, Scottish Government to consider steps to further the UNCRC, and as a result of that duty, then um, Scottish Government has to carry out a child rights and wellbeing impact assessment on all new policies and legislation. And I recognise the frustrations and the limitations of impact assessment, but this does provide a real opportunity for the committee to really look at what consideration the Scottish Government have given to children and young people's rights. And a number of the impact assessments are published so far. Interestingly, after what um, Bill has just mentioned, one of the impact assessments is around the National Transport Strategy um, refresh, um, and it was decided not to do a full impact assessment on the National Transport Strategy refresh um, because it wasn't considered necessary. And I think that really highlights the importance that children and young people's rights shouldn't just be seen in children's services. It's not just about education. Certainly concerns have been raised by our members that we do have a cabinet secretary for education. We really welcome that. We're really pleased about it. We have a minister um, for childcare and early years, but we don't have a minister for children and young people. And we need to make sure that children and young people's issues are listen to across the board. It's not just about children's services, it's about mental health, it's about transport, it's about the environment, it's the whole spectrum. And that goes back to the fact that if this committee looks at the concluding observations, um, this will provide a roadmap that makes sure that children and young people's rights are respected across all areas of policy and legislation and not just pigeonholed into children's services. Excellent, thank you. Helen. I think um, it's just important when considering young disabled people how, how they get access to work to consider the nature of work and what work looks like and it kind of goes back to the previous points that I was making about precarious work. So many young people start their working life in a precarious contract. They start in the service industry, they start in um, places where you have to work zero hours and where you're seen very much as a com commodity by your employer. And the reality is young disabled people don't get that option. They don't, they don't get the opportunity to work in those sorts of roles because the employer will not employ them. And that um, increases the, the amount that disabled people are locked out of the labour market. Um, and I think it's um, very important to consider how that impacts on um, those young people getting the, the opportunities that they really deserve to get. I think it's also important to think about young people with hidden disabilities as well. We know of cases of uh, young people who are perhaps working in the care sector or again working very, very long shifts on very, very poor conditions who, and then it exacerbates underlying conditions like heart conditions and um, they've asked for reasonable adjustments to their employer and find themselves made redundant because the employer isn't willing to make a reasonable adjustment. It's not necessarily legal, but it does happen. And it happens because the nature of the work and the way the employee is being seen by the employer, which is they are someone who is there to do a really difficult job for a really long time. And if you're not able to do that, then you're right. And that's the way it's seen. So I think the points that, that, that Bill and Morvan are making are really, really important. But I do think this, this links back into the, the nature of the labour market and how people are being treated quite generally as well. Mary. I'll, I'll be um, very, very brief, I promise. Um, in our group this morning, we had a, a similar discussion around the one that we've just had about exclusion from the workplace, but it was in relation to the BME community, about the barriers that the BME community have about getting into the workplace and the lack of progression for BME people. And, and it's also it's a similar vein to um, the lack of opportunity for people with disabilities. And I posed the question um, this morning, I'm going to pose it to, to the whole room, because everyone around this table will know of the, the glass ceiling that exists in the workplace for women and the work that's been done to eradicate the glass ceiling. But it almost seems as if there's now a glass ceiling for the BME and um, BME community and for people with disabilities and I'm just wondering if there should be more of a focus on removing 
the lack of progression or working towards removing progression for BME and people with disabilities? Mary. Thanks. Um, just to uh, echo, um, uh, re reaffirm what Helen was saying about the challenges um, people are facing in the workplace. We've heard um, a lot about um, different groups and um, the way that they're treated and, and what and it's back to this point about you know how do we remedy that in a meaningful way um, with the powers of, of the committee and of course with Brexit we've seen quite a lot um, in the news about you know what the impact will be of that um, and whilst that there's a big uncertainty around that I would hope that this committee would um, want to work with the European and External Relations Committee in terms of protecting existing workers' rights. And I know that the First Minister has um, talked about having a floor of protection. Um, and, it, you know, we, we hope that you will consider that and, and look at that. But also, the um, Scottish Government has um, commissioned a national baseline assessment on business and human rights um, as a precursor to developing a national action plan. And I think that's something as well that the committee should look at, and that's based on the UN's guiding uh, principles. And they're, they're based on something called respect, protect and remedy. Now, um, I won't go into that, but you, you know, you'll know that, uh, about the, the baseline assessment plan and, and the fact that there is a process whereby they're looking at priorities for that action plan. Um, but that's been a long time coming. You, the, the UK government has actually had a, a, a national action plan since 2013 and in fact refreshed it again in 2016. And I think um, the Scottish government really needs to focus on that and I would hope that the e Equalities and Human Rights Committee would actually um, move that process along and also um, the points I've made about the European and External Relations Committee as well and protecting workers' rights. Absolutely, it's a good good direction to put us in. Just before I go to, to, to Jeremy for a final remark because we are right up against the time, can I just take it for, for, from the room that on Mary's point about smashing some of these glass ceilings, that's something where we would, we would all agree on. I, I thought that would be the answer, um, absolutely. And again, it's something then we can, we can ensure that we, we follow up. Jeremy, you have the last few seconds to say your point. I, I mean, <laughs> I, yeah, this has probably come at a long time as it could open up a whole new tin of worms. But, um, but I do wonder if anyone would very briefly like to comment on how good are public bodies at what we've been talking about. We've been talking, Helen talked a lot about uh, companies, uh, and, and rightly so, but I just wonder, experience of NHS, local authorities, in regard to how open we are to those who have disabilities or, or other issues, or is that an area that is, needs to be looked at? I appreciate we've only got about 30 seconds, but... Out there for maybe one Helen um, and, and, and Alice, so why don't the two of you do something very, very quickly? Do, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I know the SCUC has got a yeah. particular interest in this area, and I know Alice. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that public bodies uh, you know, don't have to the same degree of exploitation associated with them. Um, there, that, isn't, that doesn't mean that there aren't necessarily problems within, within the system. So, for example, a lot of the government um, will employ people using apprenticeships. So, I mean, that's a very good scheme. It's a very good um, quality training scheme. It does bring young people into the organisation, but it probably models quite a lot of the problems that we see within the apprenticeship system. So, I mean, if only 75 young people, disabled young people are getting apprentices in Scotland and practically all the Scottish government's recruitment from, from sc sort of school level is coming through apprenticeships, then that suggests that there could potentially be a problem there. The NHS has done some really, really good work, I think, doing um, some specific schemes for uh, autistic young people and for other sort of mental disabilities into certain roles, and those have worked very, very well. Um, and they've also found that they've held retention a lot better in some previously very hard to fill roles. So I think there are examples of really good practice as well, and how you can use um, different outreach schemes and different and different recruitment techniques to actually fill positions that have been difficult to fill in the past. And um, I think there's some very good practice that can be looked at in those ways as, mo as a model of how things should be done. Um, but I think it is fair to say that if you delved into different 
to different parts of the public sector, you are likely to find problems. But it would look different than the sort of thing that I'm talking about, which is more sort of systematic and deliberate from employers. Can you share some of that good practice examples that you've got with, with the committee? Could you do that? Yes, yeah, yes, thank I you. could do. Yeah. Alistair, you have the final word. Thank you for that. That's, <laughs> that's, um, da that's somewhat daunting. Um, yeah, we, we've actually gathered quite a lot of good practice in terms of uh, equality practice over the years, and we have a lot of that available online. We've got loads of guidance and toolkits for the public sector, um, which doesn't always lead to improved practice, which I think responds to your point. Public services, by their very nature, are those which can tackle some of the significant barriers and challenges um, that we currently see in Scottish society. I hope you've had an opportunity to have a look at Is Scotland Fairer? This sets out progress over the last five years. It's one of the biggest studies of its kind. And many of the issues that are raised within it from education, um, access to um, further and higher education opportunities, and indeed as one of Scotland's biggest employers, they've got a significant role to play. Um, across our monitoring, we also find pockets of good practice. Um, many look to us to try and drive forward improvements. We're a small agency, we can't do it on our own. We look to all our partners to collaborate um, to help us achieve that. Um, but in short answer to your question, yes, we should be looking at public services very much so. OK, so we've got a job of work in our hands, haven't we? <laughs> And we've got a few more round tables with other groups as well, where I'm sure we'll come up with some, some great um, ideas and, and um, challenges and opportunities, possibly, in, in order to fi fix some of that. Can I thank you all for, for coming along this morning? We, we obviously could use much, much more time to, to, to do much more of this, but we're hoping to be the most open. In fact, we're not. I keep saying hoping. We're not hoping. We are endeavouring to be one of the most open committees in the, in the Parliament and, and as much as sharing information and as much information as you've got to share with us, it means that we do policy better and, and we need your support in that. So we're, we're, we're grateful if you could, if you could continue that, that relationship. Can I ask you all just to stay in your seats right now because we've got another wee bit of business to do and then we'll, we'll, we'll have a quick break. Um, it just means I can move on a bit quicker um, for allowing Alistair the last word. Um, so our next agenda item this morning is agenda item three, which is a nomination of our EU reporter. Mary, you'll be delighted to hear that this committee will have an EU reporter who will work very closely with the European Committee on some of the work that they are doing, because we do see a role for this committee in, in working with many of the committees across uh, this parliament in order to um, equality's proof maybe some of the work that they're doing. So, can I have a nomination for this committee's EU reporter, Jeremy? Um, Annie Wells. Annie Wells has been nominated to be our um, EU reporter for the um, Equal Opportunities Committee. Annie, are you happy to accept that nomination? Yeah, happy to accept. Well, I think committee is committee delighted to um, endorse that, that decision. Thank you very much. Thank you, Annie, for, for taking that forward and any support that we can give you, we're happy to do that. And any support that you can give Annie and her role uh, and, and, that, and that new role and I wish you well with it. Um, we're going to have a very, very quick recess to allow you all to get out of this hot room um, <laughs> and maybe go and get a cuppa and I'll briefly uh, break for a few minutes. Okay.